Many of us at some point in our lives experience heartbreak. This can be the worst, most painful ordeal, or it can be a great learning lesson and an opportunity for personal growth. My guest today is author Rick Sharp, who joins me by the magic of Skype to talk about his latest book, The Price of Heartbreak, Healing is Mindfully Feeling. We discuss the pain and shame of heartbreak, and more importantly, the life-changing positives that resulted for Rick in love and in life, And we also touch on how mindfulness played a huge role in his personal growth. I think I got to a point where um, I really had to look at myself in the mirror and acknowledge where I was. And that was a very uncomfortable situation itself. And I had to say, you know, this is not good. Something needs to change because my health was failing, etc. I would lay in bed in the morning and there was really no reason to get out of bed. And by the time that the day would pass and then the sun would set and then there was no really, then there was no real reason to get out of bed because it was time to go to sleep again. But we, but we hide it very, very well. And uh, there's lots of people out there that are suffering from depression that you would have absolutely no idea that they are. Gratitude has a very, very powerful relationship with well-being. Uh, lots of people will think about what they don't want and rather than what they do want or what they do like and, and what they don't like. Action for Happiness is a movement of people committed to building a happier and more caring society. For more episodes like this and to access our growing library of podcasts, visit actionforhappiness.org forward slash podcasts. So my guest today is Rick Sharp and and his book, The Price of Heartbreak, um, Healing is Mindfully Feeling, is a great take on the challenges of breakups, but more importantly, I guess the positives and the life lessons that we can draw draw from it and you know and what makes us happy so thank you very much for doing this rick yeah thanks Pete. thanks for having me it's a pleasure the book is beautifully written rick quite thank honestly you. and it's filled with gems of wisdom and you know philosophy but it's also an honest account of your pain through your eyes right but ultimately trying to figure out what your life was really about yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, the the thing that I, I kind of accidentally wrote the book because um, I was in a four-year relationship that I was immensely emotionally um, in, uh, involved in, so uh, invested in. So what happened basically when that ended, uh, I had this huge sense of loss, obviously, and I was... Uh, at one point, I found myself in a in a really. I think it, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back on it, it was a big it was a big state of depression. So, uh, what happened? I, I had to look back at my life and sort of say, now th- this seems to be there seems to be a recurring theme in some of these relationships in the sense that I am the common denominator. So, in order to, uh, I mean, somebody said once that. If you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result, then that's the definition of insanity. insanity so yeah. I, I really wanted to change that. So, and that way, number one, I could probably learn from that experience and take something away from it. And then in the next uh, in the next relationship, I could uh, bring a better version of myself to that. So uh, I think there was a moment of reckoning there where I I knew that if I added up all my past experiences coming up with similar results, that something had to change, you know, for the, for the benefit of uh, the rest of my life, basically. Again, you know, the book's full of amazing quotes and I'll, you know, I'll just begin with one here and it's, so happiness is rooted in many different belief systems, you know, some of which set you up for disappointment. And a cut, you know, and a couple of phrases that I really enjoyed here. I'll be happy when, I get that promotion or I'll be happy when I get a house in that neighborhood or I'll be happy when I get that Ferrari or I'll be happy when I'm making, you know, $250,000 a year. Yeah. So the reality was when you reach those milestones, you know, when you got the car and you got the job, et cetera, et cetera, you found that you were still not happy. So talk a bit about that. Well, that did actually happen to me. And, you know, what I ended up starting to realize was that happiness is not something that uh, comes from the outside. I mean, all those things are very superficial and, you know, take 
take buying a, a fast car and you drive that for a while and you want something a little bit faster. I don't think we're ever really satis satisfied with that kind of external, external stimulus. So when it, when, when it all boiled down to it, I mean, your, your happiness is inside of you and that's where you find it. Um, but that takes a long, hard look in the mirror. And, and a lot of people wonder why uh, even millionaires and CEOs where they have every, you think they have the perfect life and everything is going on. That's, uh, what seems to you that's perfect from the outside looking in, but in inside uh, these people are very, very miserable. So on, on, on the reverse side of that, there are people out there that have uh, very little, but their expectations are different and they live a very simple and, and very happy life. And, and I think uh, when we, we have to manage our expectations when it comes to our lives, I think, mm -hmm. because I think that's what kind of sets us up for disappointment because when we, when we don't manage our expectation kind of um, um, a we set ourselves up for failure because we have an expectation of something when we uh, uh, when we're in a situation where that expectation is not being met I'll give you an example of uh, it's when we read a book before we go to see the movie so when we read the book mm -hmm. uh, we, we build that movie in our own mind and we have those expectations so when we actually go to the movie we're, we're, we have that judgment already preformed. So sitting in the movie and, and, and watching the director's interpretation of that movie may not, but we may not be what we already have in our heads. So sometimes we get disappointed because it's not what we expected based on what we put through our mind as we were reading that book, if that makes sense. So it's, it's about managing those expectations as well. You know, every time I break up for me, it's usually a couple of months you know, moping around and then I break through and then it's like, okay, back to normal again. But that's not the same for everyone else, right? And like, you know, can you help explain a little bit of difference between like the pain that is felt through your high school sweetheart, for example, you know, how is that different to, you know, when we use the words depression and we use the, the words like uh, anxiety versus, you know, how does that different differ I guess we all have different base levels is trying to, you know, you know, perhaps you can talk a little bit about that. No, we do. And, and that comes from, you know, we all have different parents. We grew up in different cultures. We have different family lives and we're influenced quite a bit mm -hmm. by uh, those those peer models. Um, so, for example, and it's very different from when you're a teenager uh, as opposed from when you're older in the sense that teenagers will have the adult ability to feel emotion, but they don't have the adult ability to regulate it. Mm -hmm. So you have to wonder sometimes why teenagers are, are so confused or they, they turn to uh, external substances to um, soften that pain. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, and I'll give you a quick example just to, to sort of uh, explain that a little bit further. Your 13-year-old daughter comes home and uh, she says, I'm in love. And, of course, as a parent, you know, we, without thinking, we actually tell them, well, just a second now, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't know what love is. Mm -hmm. But we're not looking at it through their eyes. So what happens is, without us realizing it, we basically shut them down at the age of 13, which is unfortunate because why couldn't we just ask them the question about, well, that's really nice. I mean, w w what did that mean for you? And mm -hmm. she could probably say, you know, well, we held hands for the first time, but that's her idea based on her limited life experience of what mm -hmm. love is. That's her interpretation. And that makes a difference because, you know, six years later, uh, she's eight, you know, she's 18, 19 years old when some really serious stuff is going on. If she feels because you shut her down at the age of 13, she can't come to you and talk about those things she's going to turn to her friends to her no they're no no more better equipped emotionally to uh, to help her out in those particular situations than she's to, she is to figure them out on her own mm -hmm. whereas if you'd opened that door and, and 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 held that conversation then you know when she's 17 18 years old then there's probably a good chance that she could probably come to you and talk about that so i mean i use that as an example so but that's kind of an indication of where teenagers are emotionally and why that's so severe and that you know why that pain hangs on yeah. for so long into our later years mm -hmm. and you know unfortunately what we might what we we do sometimes is 
we judge the rest of our relationships based on that adolescent experience, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, because hurt people will hurt people if they're not aware of their own wounds and they won't, if they're not aware of their own wounds, they don't know where their anger comes from. Yeah. So that being said, you know, as you get on in life, um, again, your, your belief systems are set, uh, your, your, uh, um, your judgments on other people are based on your own experiences in life. And then when you get into relationships uh, at an older age, again, we have our certain expectations and, I think that uh, if you don't have those conversations, because everybody comes to a relationship with baggage, and if you don't have those conversations about, you know, what does love mean to you? What does intimacy mean to you? What does money mean to you? Sometimes we we push uh, we push triggers in each other that spark arguments that were confusing because we don't know where they come from. And, and sometimes when people are hurt or hurt people, uh, what they do is they'll be angrier with the person that's pushing that button than the person that actually created that button in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So um, something will happen and it'll invoke some anger with somebody else. And of course, if we don't have that kind of mindful awareness of ourselves, we'll react and then arguments escalate. So uh, pain at different parts of our lives is different. And emotional pain is very, very real because the pain centers in the brain don't know the difference between physical and emotional pain. It just triggers the same chemicals. So uh, for myself personally, it was a real, it was a phys it was an emotional pain that I could feel right in the middle of my chest. Mm -hmm. So for me, that, that was as physical as it got for me. And I really didn't know what to do that. And the more I dwelled on that, the more focused I became on it and the more it, it wouldn't let go because those emotions do pass um, if you let them, but the more I concentrated on it, the deeper it, got, it kind of got. And that's where it kind of led me into that depressive state. How low were you? How bad were those feelings? And how, because, you know, from the book, it's, you know, you talk about anxiety, you know, in many different situations. So for you personally, how, how low did it make you feel and how, you know, and after having written the book and the responses from other people, how actually common is that? I mean, depression is very, very common, uh, and especially amongst uh, amongst men. Um, I think for me personally, uh, I had situations where I did. I was I was in a situation also where uh, I was working from home, so uh, I didn't have that outlet to go and be around people in a professional environment. So. There was, there was many days I just wouldn't go outside the door. I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want any social interaction. Um, there were days where I would, you know, I would lay in bed in the morning and there was really no reason to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And by the time that the day would pass and then the sun would set and then there was no really, then there was no real reason to get out of bed mm -hmm. because it was time to go to sleep again. So it was one of those things where I really withdrew from, uh, all my sort of my, my social network and, uh, that just kind of feeds in on itself when, when, when you're in a depression and there were, there were nights when I turned to, uh, alcohol and I, I knew where I was going uh, and, and, and I went there knowing that I wasn't going to feel any better in the morning. Um, and that's exactly the way it happened. It just got, uh, deeper. Uh, and at some point in time, somebody else or you have to kind of see some sort of light where something needs to change because that can be a very, uh, spiraling experience. So, um, and being a man, of course, uh, I, and I talk about it in the book about, I didn't want to be vulnerable to other people. I didn't, I didn't want to expose myself. And then there's, I think there's a stigma in society in general around men who have these expectations placed on them. They want, they need to be the the provider and they want to be the protector and they want to be the mentor and the, and, and all these things, uh, when some of those things start falling apart, uh, we think ourselves less than what a quote unquote man is supposed to be. Yeah. So, but, we, but we hide it very, very well. And, uh, there's lots of people out there that are suffering from depression that you would have absolutely no idea that mm -hmm. they are. Yeah. So, you know, I always, I always sort of, 
promote the fact that, you know, be kind to everybody because you have no idea mm -hmm. you know, how being uh, being angry with somebody could, you know, turn their life in the wrong direction. Because when you when you talk to people who, who know people that have committed suicide, probably 50 percent of the people had no idea that that person was in that mm -hmm. depressive state. And when when they hear that, and it happened to a friend of mine in the UK, and when I heard that she did commit suicide, I was like, I had no clue. Yeah. So we're very, very good at hiding it, which is unfortunate. You're listening to the Action for Happiness podcast. Joining me by Skype today is author Rick Sharp. And in the second part of the podcast, we talk about the benefits of mindfulness, specifically in the context of breakups, healing and growth. You talk a little bit about the mindfulness aspect of it and how, you know, how did you get into that? And then, you know, a little bit about how, how that helped. Well, it helped a lot, actually. I, I think I got to a point where um, I really had to look at myself in the mirror and acknowledge where I was. And that was a very uncomfortable situation in itself. And I had to say, you know, this is not good. I, something needs to change because my health was failing, etc. And then in order to do that, I felt that I needed to go back and understand how I got to where I got to. Uh, and that meant some, um, some deep introspection going back into my life and looking at, I think, different events that happened in my life with where if you look at them individually, they didn't really mean that much. But if you kind of string them together, it kind of painted a bit more of a picture for me. So once I got to that point, then, of course, I had to take responsibility and say, you got yourself into this now. You need to do something to get out, to get out of it. So the, this, this got to the action part. And I then found, again, we talked about passion. I wanted to learn. I wanted to find out. I wanted to know why these things happened. Uh, so I took some, uh, I took, uh, some trainings in uh, life coaching, master life coaching, which was NLP-based. Um, and then I got into uh, emotional intelligence, where one half of that course, uh, unbeknownst to me, was about mindfulness, which really interested me. Uh, and then I, and then I took a, a, another uh, course in mindfulness. And the thing is, with mindfulness, it's, it's it's got different connotations for different people. Um, for me, it was a way to be self-aware enough to know. We talked about thoughts when they started running away on me and bringing back those painful experiences from the past, from the relationship and, you know, not being with anybody. Once I recognized that I could bring myself back to the present and mindfulness is not just about meditation. It's about being, a, being aware of your thoughts and bringing your focus back to whatever it is you're doing at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's something you can do walking down the street, driving your car, uh, pretty much anything it, across the a spectrum. It's not just about meditation, yeah. but it really, really helped me to get grounded emotionally. And by going down that intellectual road, it really helped me do that. So for that, and, and then it's kind of sparked more and more interest in, in mindfulness. And I've just mm -hmm. continued to uh, read more about it. And uh, we talked about John Kabat-Zinn. And um, listen well, if to I if I may, there, there's a, a great yeah. You know, you quoted it in your book. So you know, you put there's a book called Wherever You Go, There You Are. You know, John Kabat-Zinn yeah. wrote it, and that's what he says. You know, have you ever noticed that there's no running away from anything? The romantic notion is that if it's no good over here, you only have to go over there, and things will be different. If this job is no good, change jobs. If this wife is no good change wives if this town yeah. is no good change towns you know the underlying thinking is that the reason for your troubles is outside of you in location in others in the circumstances the trouble with this way of seeing is that it conveniently ignores the fact that you carry your head and your heart and what some would call your karma around with you you cannot escape from yourself try as you might we do not understand that it's actually possible to attain clarity understanding and transform transformation right in the middle of what is here and now yeah i mean it, it, even rumi says something along the lines that no matter you, where you go your shadow is always with you whether it's in front of you or behind you or beside you it's always there mm -hmm. so um 
I think we're really good at, I think we're really good at blaming other people and we're really good at blaming circumstances for our lot in life. And we find it very easy to um, judge other people. But when it comes to actually honestly judging ourselves, uh, that's, that's a difficult process because uh, that's, that's about, I think I said someplace in the book where if you're lying to the person in the mirror, then that's the biggest travesty because when you're lied to your, you can lie to your friends or lie to your family, you lie to everybody around you. But you know, when you're lying to yourself, uh, you, you never really do get to the truth and the truth never goes away. Yeah. It's always there. And we know it deeply and we know it in our heart and soul. And sometimes we just don't want to go there yeah. for whatever that reason is. You know, the whole point of the, the mindfulness is to help us, you know, see the ego for what it is and the story of the ego is yeah. all about me it's about i and me and my pain and my suffering right when, when, when the movie's not just all about us right when it's about this bigger picture and you even you even speak a little bit about it about the about the feeling of being connected to everything right now whether it's you know something that's learned or it's like this innate feeling of just just like we are everything right this whether it's a spiritual connection or a literal connection to, to everything yeah, and I think we are. I mean, we we are scientifically or quantum field speaking, we, we are energy, all of us. Everything is energy. And it's interesting how, uh, depending on the people that you're around, how their positive or neg negative energy, actually you absorb that and you walk away kind of in the same frame the person that you just stepped into. And um, that whole energy field can be measured and I think that stems from uh, from a meditative perspective where uh, we talked, you, you just kind of alluded to it, where our daily lives are full of stress all the time. And the stress mm -hmm. comes from everywhere. Our bodies are not wired for that because mm -hmm. um, our bodies are wired for fight and flight. Something happens, uh, we run or we fight, and then it's over. And then our bodies return to a homeostasis or, or, or sense of balance. But in today's day and age, as human beings, we can't do that because we're being bombarded from stress from all kinds of different things. And we're the only animals on the planet can manufacture our own stress just by thinking about something. Mm -hmm. And again, that could be stress from I'm, I'm late, I've got to pick up bread and I'm doing this. And that kicks out the same hormones in your body as if it's in a fight or you know if it's in a uh, fight or flight state so yeah. it never gets a chance to settle down so yeah. it continually stays out of balance and then finally your body then starts to really think that that is normal and when that constant ongoing stress carries on for longer periods of time then your immune system starts to shut down um, your blood flows in your extremities is you're, you're never in this kind of parasympathetic nervous system state mm -hmm. where that's the time to grow and to uh, relax. So that's why people end up getting sick because um, the, the, your body's just not designed that way to handle that kind of stress on a day to day basis, day in, day out. And ultimately, happiness as well, right? You know, if you're, well, if, if you're, if you're, if your body's feeling like, that way then ultimately you know we're talking about just even wanting to get out of bed in the morning and and, yeah. and how and how the lens in which you perceive your life right if you're if just things internally are not functioning well then it's it will have a detrimental effect on the on the way that you live and the way you see your life yeah exactly and the thing is is that and then we focus on it which makes it worse it intensifies it so uh you know, in mindfulness, there's also uh, uh, some talk about, you know, great gratitude and gratefulness. And I think gratitude has a very, very powerful relationship with well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of people will think about what they don't want and rather than what they do want or what they do like and, and what they don't like. Mm -hmm. So, again, when it's, it's that kind of associative thinking where if I'm, you know, just to, just to pick an example, 
if I, I say like I really don't like peanut butter, just the fact that you said the word peanut butter is mm. is bringing your focus towards that, which is a negative focus. Whereas if you're saying like I, I would I I really love I don't know strawberry jam, mm. so the negative thought never actually comes into it. So yeah, that absolutely affects our happiness because we're not sort of trying to walk backwards on the treadmill mm. um, because that negative fe- feeling is or thinking is is, is very dominant. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, um, I don't know if you know them, the Gottmans are, uh, a, a PhD couple in the States and they actually talk about how relationships function and are, and are dysfunction. Mm-hmm. And what's amazing about these people, they will, can, they can interview people on camera for three episodes, mm-hmm. uh, for, for three sessions. And within about a 90 plus percentage can say within five years, this couple will be divorced and this pu- couple won't. But in that research, um, they realized it takes um, five times more positive affect to turn around one negative affect, if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah. So it's be just because the negative is, is so powerful and it sticks with us. And like I said, you know, our, our bodies are wired that way to, to look out for danger, to look out for the negative. And uh, it, it takes a real mindset to really turn that around and change that way of thinking. So having written this this book now, you know, what what is what what is next? You know, is there another book on the on the horizon or you know what what's next for you? Yeah, there is. No, that there is and um like I mentioned earlier, it's one where I've realized that everybody has a story and everybody's story is unique. And sometimes we hear a lot about people like Anthony Bourdain and, and, and celebrities that, that commit suicide and the world goes into a shock for two weeks and then all of a sudden mental health is on the front lines on the headlines of every newspaper for a couple of weeks and then it dies. But my point is is that the guy that's next door to you, his story is just as important to him as Anthony Bourdain's story is to the world. Mm-hmm. So in order to raise that kind of awareness, um, I'm interviewing uh, people that tell me where they were uh, in their lives that was very that was terrible for them, and you know, what was what happened that made them decide that they want to change that, mm. what they did to change it, and where they are now. So it, it, it encapsulates a, a small journey of that sort of portion of their life, and one of them being my daughter, which was really hard to listen to. Mm. So uh, as a parent, so. And again, the point being is that when people read a collection of the seven or eight stories of of these real life journeys, um, and they're at in their own life at, at, at some point in that journey, then they can resonate with it. Maybe they can take something away from what other people have done to improve their lives and try it on their own, or give them the courage to speak out about it, which I think is is a huge message. Yeah. So I guess one final question then, um, you know, what, what matters most for you? What matters most for me? Um, what matters most for me is I think I'm kind of, uh, in my later years now. And, um, I mean, we can say, I wish I had started this journey a lot earlier, but all things happen for a reason. So what matters me for most is for me to keep learning um, and growing and using things like emotional intelligence, mindfulness, and uh, meditation to, to present the best version of myself I can. Mm-hmm. And I think that when I can become very, very self aware of what's going on inside me, then that gives me the, um, the opportunity to interact with others around me in a much more positive way. And the last thing is I think I've come to grips with my past and I think, uh, and, and how I relate to that. And I think that really matters to me in the sense that my relationships with uh, other people are, uh, are a lot better. And I've noticed that a lot in the last six months. All right. So if we want to find out about, you know, your upcoming projects or, you know, to get hands on the, on, on your books, where, where can people find out more about you? Yeah. I mean, I have my, I have a website, uh, Rick Dash Sharp with an E dot com. Uh, the book is available on Amazon, and uh, people can get it there. 
and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, the best way. All right then, mate. Well, thank you very much for you know for sharing that because I know these this gets to the root, right? This top this touches deep, and for you know to put your your heart and soul into into sharing your stories in in the book, it's um you know it, it truly is a, a remarkable feat, and so so thank you very much for for coming and and sharing some of that stuff today. Well, thank you very much for having me, Gui, and uh, and I think your podcast is a great one. I think that uh, your guests, I think, bring a lot to your listeners. And uh, yeah, keep up the great work. And remember, if you'd like to help create a kinder and happier world, please get involved with Action for Happiness. You can join thousands of others who are spreading a bit more happiness in their homes, workplaces, schools, and local communities. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and follow to keep up to date with all our content. Find out more at actionforhappiness.org. Join the movement, be the change.